Merry Christmas, Oak Ridge. It is wonderful to be with you. We started this new series along with the Advent season last week called His Name Shall Be. And I want to invite you just right up front, if you have a Bible with you, whether it's a paper Bible or a digital Bible, maybe you need to open a new tab or borrow a Bible, go ahead and do that. But if you would lift your Bible up nice and high and just say, I got my Bible, PJ. Man, I'm so glad that you have a Bible with you this morning. And I would invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. There's a few other passages that we're going to look at this morning, but kind of our key focus really throughout this series is Isaiah chapter 9. Quick show of hands this morning. How many of you, if I was to go to your home tonight or maybe some point throughout the Christmas season, you do something to celebrate the Christmas season with some kind of lights that you hang up? Maybe it's a, a Christmas tree. Maybe it's a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Maybe you hang some outside. Maybe you just put the candles in the windows and call it done. But you do something to celebrate with lights, right? One of the most common traditions that we have as people is to celebrate at Christmas by hanging lights. And some of us, we're, we're modest, you know, it's just the candle in the window, or maybe it's the little Charlie Brown Christmas tree, and that's all we feel like doing. Some of us, it's an elaborate display, and we love to go all out and put Christmas lights everywhere and have the most impressive display possible. In the Christmas movie, Deck the Halls is a family a movie that my family has come to enjoy. There's a character named Buddy Hall. And Buddy Hall decides that he is going to make it his mission during the Christmas season to light his house so brightly that it can be seen from outer space. Needless to say, this does not keep him in good graces with his neighbors who have to look at his light display and also gets him into trouble with his family. But I want you to take a look this morning at Buddy's final Christmas light display. So whether you are a Buddy Hall, a Clark W. Griswold, or you just use the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, there are, again, there is a long-standing, well-established part of our holiday celebration is using lights. And I think we'll see in today's scripture reading that there's a good reason why lights are such an important part of our celebration, as they are intended to remind us of the Messiah, Jesus. And this morning, I want to start by looking at the key passage for our series uh, in its context in Isaiah chapter 9. And so again, hopefully you're there. Isaiah chapter 9, his prophecy starts out this way in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. 
You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have scattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. It'll be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In Isaiah's prophecy, and specifically verse 6, there's these names that are given to this son who would be born. And these names have been sometimes referred to as throne names, following an ancient practice that was common at the time that Isaiah wrote his prophecy. It was kind of common for kings when they ascended to their throne, particularly in Egypt, the people would ascribe to them certain names. And they were kind of prophetic names. They were names that were kind of the desire as that king became the next king. These were the hopes that the people had. This is what that king is going to do. This is what we believe that that king's reign is going to look like. And Isaiah is foreseeing this day for God's people who are living in oppression. He sees a time and he sees a day when God is going to raise up a new king who will rule over his people. And Isaiah ascribes these names to him, these throne names saying, this is what this Messiah is going to look like. This is what his reign is going to be like. This is what we are hoping he will do. He will be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And each one of these throne names, if you will, help us to understand a little better who, were, who is this Messiah? How did he fulfill the hopes of the people of the first century? And who is he for us? Last week, Pastor Christia shared with us about the first of these throne names, Wonderful Counselor. That Jesus Christ is extraordinarily incomprehensible. That our Messiah is beyond what we can fathom, beyond what we can understand. That a God who had created stars and heavens would allow himself to be born as a baby in a manger for us. He is wonderful and incomprehensible, and he is our counselor. He is our advocate. In one sense, it's the legal sense that he is our advocate. He dies on the cross so that the penalty that sinners would owe God, death and separation, would be dealt with by him. And incomprehensibly, the star creator become a baby in a manger, dies on a cross to say that sinners can come back into relationship with the God in whose image they were created. And this wonderful counselor, he's also our counselor practically. He walks with us through life in prayer and the spirit and the word and his people. We have relationship and connection ongoing with this God. Now, for me, as I read Isaiah chapter 9, I see a couple of different literary structures at work. As you read and as you study scripture, one of the ways to really try to understand anything that you read is to understand how was it written? How is this passage kind of put together and worked together? And, And the better we understand how it works together, the better we can understand what the human author And the true divine author was trying to get us to understand. So kind of maybe slightly heady Bible study here for a second, but I see two different passage, or kind of literary structures working together here in this passage. One of them is substantiation. And substantiation is kind of the the opposite of causation. Causation moves from cause to effect. Substantiation moves from effect to cause. And so as you read Isaiah chapter 9, you kind of see in the first five verses, here's what this Messiah is going to do because there's a son given. 
God wants some things to happen for his people. This is the effect that God wants to see. And why is that going to happen? Because for us, a son is given. To us, there's a child who is born, and the government will be upon his shoulders. I also see the literary structure of generalization in these passages. The first five verses kind of share the specifics. Here's some of the details of what this is going to look like, of what God wants to do. And in general, we're given these throne names. These are what that's going to look like. As we look at what God is going to do, he's going to be a wonderful counselor. And and these verses kind of relate back earlier in the passage. So wonderful counselor, we kind of see fleshed out in verse 1. We we see this idea of a mighty God in verse 2. We see this idea of an everlasting father in verse 3 and a prince of peace in verses 4 and 5. And so for us today, as we focus on our mighty God, we'd go back to verse 2 which says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The mighty power of the Messiah is to be for God's people like the power of a bright light shining in the darkness. Have you ever experienced the power of being in the darkness and having a bright light shine? I remember Christia and I, when we lived up in Chicago, we used to go out on our back porch sometimes at night, and we would sit back there, and it would kind of be dark. And for whatever reason, I think in Chicago, there's just a shortage of parking, and the church parking lot was like a cool place for people in the community to come. And so we would be sitting back on our porch, and the beautiful scenery that we had was the church parking lot. And inevitably, while we're sitting there in the darkness, just kind of talking about whatever it is that we're chatting about, somebody would come in the parking lot, I don't even think they saw us, but they would drive in and they would shine their lights directly at our faces. And we were just absolutely blinded. Like, do they not see us? Now that we are illuminated, do they not see us? But there is power to light, especially this bright light shining in the darkness. And I think that this passage is further fleshed out in the totality of Scripture. It helps us to draw together the Old Testament and the New Testament to really understand who this Jesus is, who this Messiah is, who this Son who is called a mighty God is. For the Jewish people, the people who first heard Isaiah's prophecy, and they read this idea that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, that in deep darkness a light has dawned, I think they would have immediately begun to connect some dots in their mind of darkness and light. And their minds would have been drawn back to the very beginning of Scripture, where it says this in Genesis chapter 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. The very first audience would have heard this idea that Isaiah is saying that on the people living in darkness, a great light has dawned, and their minds would have remembered this is what happened in creation. There was this chaos, and there was this darkness, and God's voice, by his power, by the power of his spoken word, light came to be. One of Jesus' closest disciples, John, picked up on this theme. He begins his gospel this way. He says, in the beginning was the word. Now I would love to go into kind of the idea of what the word word means there. It's a Greek philosophical term, but for today and to kind of save us some time, I'm just going to put Jesus in there instead. Is that all right? Uh, There's some great philosophy about that, and we can probably cover it another sermon another time. But in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. But he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. But the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And even though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. So he came to that which was his own, and his own didn't receive him. And yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So what is it this morning that ties these passages together that help us to understand who this Messiah was supposed to be and, in fact, who he is? Why is it that when we think of Jesus, we ought to ascribe to him the title Mighty God? For one, he is the God of creation. He is the word. He is the one who was with God and was God at the beginning. And in the very beginning of creation, when all was darkness and all was chaos and God spoke, it was Jesus. He was the word who was with God and was God. And by him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. He speaks. And by the power of his voice, the universe is formed. He's that powerful. There was no action that the Father took apart from Jesus. Jesus and the Father are one, and so Jesus, our Messiah, was intimately involved in this act of creation. It was Jesus who first spoke light into the darkness, order out of chaos. And I would argue he's still in that business. He's still in the business of making something out of the chaos of our lives. Because if we're honest with ourselves this morning, probably all of us go through periods of life where we feel like those people in Isaiah 9 too. People walking in darkness and chaos. People who live in the land of darkness, wondering why am I going through this? It doesn't make sense, like this pre-creation existence in Genesis 1. All there is is darkness and chaos. And God's promise through the Messiah is that he can break forth into your life like the power of a bright light to bring hope and power into the midst of what feels like darkness, to bring order and peace in the midst of what feels like chaos, to bring design and joy in what feels like confusion or pain, to bring presence and love into what feels like pain and loss. Jesus is our mighty God, and by his voice the universe came into being, and this same mighty God still desires to speak into your life. Jesus is the mighty God of creation. Jesus is our mighty God because he is holy. Light stands out in darkness. In Genesis chapter 1, it's the very first thing that God does when he speaks light into existence. Genesis 1 says God separates the light from the darkness. The darkness he calls night and the light he calls day because light stands out in the darkness. We don't have to look very hard to find darkness. Ever since Adam and Eve ate fruit in the Garden of Eden, the darkness of sin ravages our world. Wars and violence, greed, injustice, poverty, hunger, human trafficking, disease, anxiety, loss, pain, fear, death. They're all the result of sin. And yet the life that Jesus lived was one of perfect holiness. He was different from the darkness around him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The light that existed came to this earth and lived among us in perfect holiness. 
and he met those living in sin and he called them to go and sin no more. He extended grace to those in fear of judgment. He granted healing to those struggling with disease and welcomed those who were outcast. He connected sinners to the grace of God's very presence. Jesus is perfect holiness. He stands out amongst the darkness just as light stands out from the darkness. He is a mighty God. And part of the beauty of the might of this God is that he didn't hold his holiness to himself, but he imparts this holiness to those who would believe in him. His desire is to extend that holiness that those who trust him can take part in it. He is a mighty God. He was with God in creation. He is holy, and he brings forth life. He was the one who created life, in the very beginning, in, in the Garden of Eden, this creation moment we read about in Genesis chapter 1, he sustains life for all of humanity. And for those who stray and walk away, he offers life again. He renews life for us. Jesus' desire for you is that you would experience life and life abundantly, says John 10.10. 10. He wants the absolute best for you. Death and darkness and chaos are the result of separation from God. But light and life are the result of our connection to Him. Jesus' desire is not to ruin your fun or to keep you from experiencing good things on this earth, but rather to invite you into what will truly bring fulfillment and the greatest experience in life. The devil is a liar who tempts us with all kinds of false promises that never measure up. Saying, if you would do this, you would enjoy yourself. If you would do this, it would bring you peace. If you would do this, maybe it would allow you to chase after the love that you want. But the devil is such a liar. And every time we pursue the sin that he offers, it leaves us in more darkness and closer to death. But by his power, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the mighty God who created life and sustains life, offers new life. He says, you can be redeemed and made new in me. Your whole identity and purpose and who you are can change because of the work of our Messiah. He's that powerful. He can change even you. Our Messiah is more powerful than the chaos that existed before creation. He's the one who can speak into that chaos and bring forth order and life. He's more powerful than the darkness of sin that we see all around us because he is holy. He offers us life. He created it and sustains it. And he offers it again to us. And all we need to do is recognize and receive him. At his first coming, he came to that which were his own. And they didn't recognize him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the, the life that gives life was in the world and the world didn't recognize him. Our role is only to recognize that the Messiah has come. That Jesus is here. He's the God of creation. He's the Holy One. He's the one who offers life, who created it, sustains it, and redeems it. And we have the ability to see and to worship our mighty God this morning. So my hope for you as you drive around the community this Christmas season, as you visit the church, and even maybe as you sit at home and see the twinkling lights, may you be reminded of the light that shines in the darkness. Be reminded of the promised Messiah. Be reminded of the one who had the power to speak light into the darkness. The word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us who calls us to recognize that he is God's promised Messiah, our mighty God. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I don't think we pause often enough to just realize your strength. To realize the power of a God 
who in the midst of darkness and chaos speaks and universes are formed. Light comes into being by the breath of your word. That word that was with God and was God in the very beginning by which all things were created. And in the person of Jesus, that word that spoke the universe into being has become flesh and dwells among us. Ultimately, in order that you would give your life to bring forth the life that you had created, that you then died to redeem back to people. God, I pray that you would help us to see you. Help us not to miss the presence of our God in our world, in our church, in one another. God, help us not to miss what you are doing. Help us not to continue to go through life and feel like there is no hope and there is no power and there is no strength. Help us in those moments when our life feels like we are lost in chaos and darkness and we don't know where to turn. Help us to have eyes to see the light that shines in the darkness. To know that God offers us hope. To know that we don't have to do it alone. That we don't have to continue to pursue the darkness. That we don't have to continue to wander around lost in the chaos. But that there is a light. That God sent Jesus Christ to this earth. And that he is a mighty God. As mighty as he was at the moment of creation, he is still at work to bring order, light, and life out of the darkness and chaos that we wander in. So help us to see you, to recognize and to receive you, to trust you. And all of these things that we go through and all of the chaos and all of the busyness and all of the fear and the anxiety and the doubt and the temptation, and even in the moments where we falter into sin, help us to see the light that is Jesus and to trust not in our strength, not in our ability to pick ourselves back up and do something with our lives, but help us to see that our God is infinitely greater than we could ever imagine, to trust the Messiah who was promised to a people living in the land of darkness, walking in darkness. A great light has shined. Help us to trust our mighty God this morning, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, in whose name I pray. Amen. We want to remind you that you can give your offerings as you exit this morning and also online at oakridgewc.com slash give. We want to invite you to come back and join us uh, next week. We'll continue our series, but there's lots of opportunities before you get to next Sunday. A concert with Jonathan White tomorrow. Campfire Christmas coming up on Saturday. Am I forgetting something or you're giving me weird looks? She's waiting to see. I don't know. What am I going to say next? If you're in the Living Nativity, we would love for you to come forward uh, to help us go over some things. Five to ten minutes. We'll get started with our meeting. That sounded really awkward. Great transitions. We love you. We hope you have a fantastic week. If you are in the Living Nativity, five or ten minutes, please come meet us up here. Have a great week. Go with God. We hope to see you a few times this week. God bless. <laughs>